Assalamualaikum. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mr. Nurul Huda Huda. It's a very attractive name. What is the meaning of your name? So this name basically means the light of right guidance. All right. Each one of us is going to ask you four or five questions on the subjects that you have studied, and also general questions about Pakistan and all. Islamabad happens to be your favorite city. Now, would you like to tell us who designed the master plan of the city? So it was done during Ayub Khan's presidency during his tenure. However, I don't exactly recall the name of the person. It was done by a Greek architect. Nayad. No, sir, I cannot recall. Constantinos Doxiades. All right. Now, Islamabad is suffering from an acute shortage of water. The whole country is doing that, but uh, specifically Islamabad. Would you think that the decision to shift the capital to that particular place was the correct decision or should it, should it have been um, shifted somewhere else, keeping in view the acute shortage of water? For example, across the Marglas, close to the Hanpur Dam. So actually, when this decision was taken back in the time, the main presumption behind the decision was the fact that Islamabad happened to be actually uh, away from the basic commercial and business activities uh, and the center of the commercial activities happened to be Karachi. So uh, the president decided to make it farther from that region in order to make it more inclusive and more diverse and to make it more representative of the population of Pakistan and to even make it more accessible to all the population well, as that's well. That's true, but that's not the answer to my question. So the acute shortage of water has happened over the course of time. Uh, we have observed that the underground water level has decreased. However, at that time when this decision was made, there was no such report of a decreasing level of water. So I believe that's the reason why this was not uh, kept. Okay, in let's move on. Pakistan is out of the FATF grey list. Now I want your views. What steps should the country take to remain out of the grey list? So we need to address all the concerns by means of which we had been put in the list in the first uh, place. For instance, we have to make sure that our money, uh, entire money laundering and terror financing uh, uh, inputs are well in place. And we are taking the measures that will ensure that this practice, which has actually taken us out of the list, keeps on going. We need to make sure that our customs and other intelligence departments not work in silos, rather they, keep, uh, they actually collaborate with each other in order to bring more efficiency and in order to make it more effective for the rest. Okay. One of the major exports of Pakistan comprises of textile goods. Why is it that today we see Bangladesh is far ahead of us in the export of textile goods? Now, whereas they don't even produce one pod or bud of cotton, how did this happen? So I would like to quote what was done in 1978 when Mr. Nurul Qadir Khan actually uh, incentivized the labor efficiency and invested in the human capital development. He sent the people of Bangladesh to South Korea so as to make them more sensitized with how the labor is working towards manufacturing and not just exporting the raw material. Now, Bangladesh is working on ready-made garments and this one point actually differs from what we are doing in Pakistan. Pakistan is more focused on exporting the raw material, cotton. However, Bangladesh has been more focused on producing ready-made garments, RMGs. And this is where Pakistan needs to learn a lesson as well, that instead of exporting just raw cotton, we need to make sure that we are more incentivizing our labor and human capital development. Also, we are working towards producing and exporting ready-made garments instead of just sending uh, our raw cotton, because that will put us on a better comparative advantage as well. 
We have seen that in recent months, there has been a surge in terrorism in Pakistan. And TTP is being blamed for this. Sometimes they uh, accept the, just take the responsibility themselves. Now, what is the way out? Should we invite them and sit with them on the neg negotiating table or should there be a military action against them? I need your views on that. So I believe over the course of history, we have observed that our policy of appeasement with the terrorist outfits has not actually healed us any good. Therefore, I come to this conclusion that the policy of appeasement must be put aside and a kinetic military action that involves not only eradicating the terrorism from, its, uh, from the grassroots level, but also involves sensitization of the masses and bringing all the uh, strata of society on one table to counter it is important. And that is what we need at most. Okay, my last question. What is CASA 1000? Uh, so CASA 1000 is basically a renewable energy initiative that, was, uh, that actually took place in uh, 2016. It aims at uh, supplying extra energy from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to Afghanistan and Pakistan. It would uh, include around 1300 megawatts of electricity uh, in this project. However, we are still in the process of uh, completing it. What does CASA stand for and what does 1000, the figure 1000 mean? So CASA stands for uh, Central Asia, South Asia. However, I'm not sure about the word 1000. You were supposed to get 1000 megawatts. 300 were to go to Afghanistan, therefore 1000. But then now it has been decided, the Afghan said they don't need it. So all the electricity will be coming to us. Thank you. Over to you. Dear. In this water treaty has been a very important breakthrough. What has been the background of this uh, treaty? Why were the two countries had to sit down and sign that treaty? So this treaty was uh, negotiated with the help of World Bank between Pakistan and India uh, due to the ongoing water crisis before 1960s. And actually after this treaty it was decided that the three eastern tributaries of Indus River would supply water to uh, India and then the western ones would supply water to Pakistan. So this was actually the landmark agreement that has averted and that has actually stood the test of time as well. It has uh, mitigated the issues of uh, crisis between India and Pakistan over water uh, for a very long period of time. However, uh, now re recently we have seen that India has been trying to unilaterally uh, revise this treaty uh, given the situation and Pakistan is not ready uh, for this because there, has, there hasn't been any certain clause in order to revise this. What has been the process for revision or amending the treaty? Has it been laid down somewhere? Must have been laid down somewhere? So uh, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties uh, basically lays down the entire process as to how the treaty will be formulated and if required how it will be amended as well. However, we have seen that in the context of Indus Water Treaty, there has been no such clause entered uh, into the amendment process and if any amendment has to occur, it should involve both the stakeholders and the mediating party as well. What have been the positive consequences of this treaty as far as Pakistan is concerned? So this treaty has actually uh, obstructed the way of uh, construction of dams uh, from the Indian side that would otherwise hamper the provision of water to Pakistan. Had there been no treaty, the uh, provision of water from the Indian side to Pakistan would have been hampered at a drastic level and it would have led to the uh, uh, severe water scarcity and other irrigation related issues on the Pakistani side as well. When were the dams, bigger dams in Pakistan or biggest dams in Pakistan made and uh, why were they made? With whose help were they made? So I'm not certain about this. Okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay, um, Rikodik case has been a very important case. 
has been uh, sort of uh, there in the news items also, the breaking news also. Uh, they have been court interventions also. What is the background of the case? So, Rekodek area basically lies in the Balochistan province of Pakistan. And it was the, around the year 1992 uh, when, uh, uh, at the first instance, the Balochistan Development Authority gave licenses uh, to the US based company. Uh, Broken Hills. In, uh, this was actually an initiative in order to excavate minerals from the land of Balochistan. However, it is important to understand that a presumption, uh, a, 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 a clause was given by Pakistani side that only excavation would be uh, would take place from uh, uh, Pakistani land, and for refining purpose, no material would be taken outside the country. However, it was reported in 2012 by Dr. Samar Mubarak Man that uh, a company which was later on given the stakes in the Recodec case, in the Recodec uh, excavation process, was actually taking out gold from Balochistan and not only taking it out, but also exporting it back to their own country. So this was the start uh, of the entire conflict where when Balochistan Development Authority cancelled the licenses of all the excavation uh, companies and uh, when Tethyan uh, Copper Company took us to the International Court for the Settlement of Investment Disputes as well. And our entire uh, litigation on the process began. However, recently we have seen that Pakistan has reached out and out of the court settlement uh, with the involved stakeholders. And now uh, the companies will resume the work and the excavation will also take place. However, the, uh, uh, give, uh, the proportion of uh, the said shares of Balochistan are increased to 37% and the total profit and 37% of the total profit will go to Balochistan. On this premise, this uh, excavation process has began again. Okay, okay, okay. NFC award is one of the most important awards as far as uh, apportionment of money or resources are concerned. What has been, what was the latest award uh, announced? So it was back in 2010 uh, and it's the last award we had. Uh, we couldn't develop a consensus over uh, getting an other NFC award due to the political economy involved in the NFC and that's the reason we are still stuck besides the argument that this, uh, this award has to be revised every five years. So we are unable to do that. What are the factors which define or determine based on those factors the uh, financial award? The most important factors that determine what the award should be? So I can think of four factors. Uh, uh, basically they are based on the population of that particular region. Population is one. Okay, what else? Then there is uh, poverty and backwardness as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in water population density of that said region. Okay. And uh, uh, so I cannot recall the next. Uh, are, text collection. And text collection. Exactly. There are provinces which agitated against the previous awards based on population. Why did they do that? And what changes were made as far as NFC was concerned? So the, uh, uh, you are very true when you say this. And uh, actually the claims were made by the provinces which have lesser population against the uh, provinces having bigger population. So that's the point where other factors were also involved into, uh, uh, into making the decision out for NFC. And that's when along with population, other three factors were also involved when it comes to the distribution of NFC awards. Which provinces did benefit out of that, uh, out of the new arrangement? And which provinces were at loss? So I believe Balochistan and KPK would have uh, been at a, a, a benefit after the revision because they, these were the provinces having low population and naturally uh, Sindh and uh, Punjab would have been at loss. Thank you. In Nuruddha, what is your inspiration to join civil service? So during the past few years, I have had the chance to work uh, with the media industry of Pakistan in both public and private sectors. And that was the point when I decided that my inclinations are more towards administration rather than towards joining my own uh, field of study. It was the point when I realized that my skills and my abilities make me a better suitable candidate for administration rather than this. Also, 
uh, my father has motivated me a lot to pursue uh, administration and that's one reason why I had been trying to get into the civil service. Okay. So, your interaction with media in a way has been helpful in determining your choice. How the role of media has evolved over the last maybe five years? So, we have seen that uh, with the advent of digitization in the media industry, the entire landscape of media has evolved from what it was back in the years, uh, in the early years of Pakistan. Actually, now the citizen journalism has enabled every particular citizen and every particular individual of the country to come out of his shell and to start reporting and to start analyzing what has been happening around. Although this has done more harm than good, because naturally all the citizens are not media sensitized and are not equally capable to analyze the events as per the requirements of media industry. However, it has also been helpful in giving voice to the concerns of people and allowing people to exercise their freedom of uh, opinion and freedom of expression. It is said that Pakistan has not been able to realize its uh, great agricultural potential. So what three reforms would you recommend, which you think I mean, are needed to make a turnaround? So uh, I believe uh, we need to diversify our crop production are the first uh, thing. For that matter, we can uh, actually incline ourselves towards crop zoning. That is, we dedicate certain areas to produce certain crops so that uh, the uh, areas that can produce best yields of those certain crops can be used to our own advantage. For instance, in the recent years, we have seen that South Punjab has started irrigating more sugarcane instead of cotton. Uh, however, the land in South Punjab is more feasible for the production of cotton. But due to market concerns and other market forces, our inclinations towards agri uh, agri agricultural productions are not very educated. Our choices are not very educated. Secondly, I believe that instead of uh, resorting to flood irrigation systems, we need to uh, delve deeper into the modern techniques like sprinkler technique and others that are being used universally and around the world as well. Lastly, I believe that we need to uh, uh, improve our soil health as well. And this can be done through uh, terracing and using other techniques that are being used around the world so that we don't harm our land for the uh, uh, for temporary gains. Okay. Then it is said that uh, dollar as international currency is facing multiple challenges. Your take on it? So certain recent developments have actually indicated to the fact that the ongoing uh, era is moving more towards de-dollarization. And this term has been uh, used by the international media and other factors as well. Uh, we have certain evidences of it as well, that uh, uh, China has been trying to uh, consolidate its currency, renminbi. We have seen that uh, Moscow has been trying to uh, trade in rubles. Also, the emergence of BRICS with its own currency also indicates to the same. And we have also witnessed how Saudi Arabia has been trying to uh, get more closer towards China and uh, trade with it in their currency and has shown its agreement to it as well. So these factors do uh, indicate the fact that there, are, there is uh, an ongoing rise of other currencies. However, uh, it is also a fact that the consolidated market price of dollar cannot be uh, decreased or diminished in any time soon and it will naturally take a lots of time to for other currencies to get up and get consolidated just like dollar is what ails pakistan economy that we have not been able to overcome its structural issues what in your opinion are the three areas which need urgent attention so that we can make a turnaround in economy so we need to introduce market reforms. We need to incentivize human capital development rather than just trying to export the raw materials and not producing uh, valuable products and not working on the value addition of the products. We need to work more on these areas. Secondly, uh, there is a need that we enable the youth bulge of Pakistan to be better competitive and to 
uh, be more inclusive into making the economy more self-reliant. Rather than exporting the raw materials, we need to induce uh, market reforms and we also need to diversify our market uh, approaches as well. Uh, we need to diversify our resources and we need to touch the Central Asian and uh, other markets as well, rather than just being uh, inclined towards European Union and uh, the markets we have been traditionally inclined to for many long years. Okay, the last question. Uh, difference between IMF and the World Bank? So, uh, IMF and World Bank are generally considered the two institutions that deal with the global uh, financial uh, issues. However, IMF is more inclined towards uh, working as a watchdog over uh, the states and to provide them with loans and provide them with uh, debts so as they can do better in their economies. However, when it comes to World Bank, the uh, programs are more focused towards development funding and towards enabling the uh, uh, countries to do better than what they are doing. So it's basically the uh, difference in the way they work. One is working towards debt provision and the other, uh, World Bank, the later one is working more towards uh, uh, development funding. Okay, Nurul Uda, you being a student of this uh, mass communication and media person, a few questions from uh, this mass communication. What are various theories regarding, one of them is magic bullet theory. Can you explain it? So the basic presumption of magic bullet theory is that the audience that tends to receive the media content is very passive and they don't know and they cannot di uh, differentiate between what is good for their uh, own views. So whatever the media shows them, they are bound to accept it, no matter if they agree to it or not. And when they are bound to accept it, they naturally have to uh, have to rely on media completely in building their opinions as well. So for uh, uh, in magic bullet theory, the individuals are basically considered to be passive and they are uh, completely dependent on media to build their own opinions. Okay, how would you correlate our present day social media with reference to this magic bullet theory? Sir, I believe social media has has actually opened many uh, vistas for the people and the magic bullet theory is not very relevant when it comes to the social media and other digital media uh, because people are very opinionated and they are not hesitant in being vocal about what they think. So now audience is not passive, rather very active when, it, when they consume the media content. Okay. Uh, you have opted for the international uh, relations too? Yes, sir. What is the Estrada Doctrine? So and who propounded it? So Estrada Doctrine takes its name from the uh, uh, Foreign Secretary of Mexico, Gennaro Estrada. And he uh, uh, actually proposed that ir uh, regardless of the way a country has attained uh, its uh, uh, independence or regardless of the way how a country is being governed, uh, rather it's legal or not, rather there is authoritarian government or a democratic one, it must, uh, it must be recognized. And then next question is, what is de facto and uh, de jure uh, recognition with reference to this doctrine? Yes, sir. Uh, so these are basically the two types of recognition that are being, that are generally extended towards different nations of the uh, world, different countries of the world. Uh, in the de facto recognition, uh, the countries are given a temporary recognition, which can be withdrawn. And this recognition does not entitle the a particular country to be a part of the UN or, or to be uh, entitled to the succession rights or to be entitled to uh, send their diplomats to other countries as well. However, in the de jure recognition, we have seen that the countries are entitled to all these uh, previously mentioned rights and this particular recognition cannot be withdrawn from them as well. World in general and Pakistan in particular is known as victim of the climate change. Yes, sir. What's your takeaway? So recently we have seen that the climate change has been uh, uh, very evident uh, from the ongoing uh, from the ongoing changes in the world as well as in Pakistan as well. The recent surge of floods and the uh, uh, continuous uh, rainfall as well, regardless of the months we are in, indicates one cue to this as well. Uh, we have seen that the world is all together into dealing with the climate change as well. However, there is this concern that the steps and initiatives being taken are not in the right direction and are not 
equitable for all. The uh, effects are being uh, received by the countries which are not much contributing towards the issue at large. So there is a need that the world moves towards more equitable uh, reforms in order to actually address the issue and not just taking it in papers and conferences. Okay, what role media can play towards the climate change? So media has a huge responsibility to sensitize the populations and to educate them about the right choices they can make in order to address the issue of global warming and climate change. And media stands uh, very responsible when it comes to uh, not only sensitization the masses about it, but also into building a channel between the policymakers, stakeholders and the public which is being affected by it. So the concerns are uh, the concerns of the people can be channeled to the policymakers and stakeholders, and a dialogue can be made, which can be ultimately very productive into addressing this. Last question: What is your priority group? So uh, my priority group is Pakistan Administrative Service. What are the major responsibilities of uh, the fresh incumbent as assistant commissioner? Uh, so the assistant commissioners are actually. Uh, responsible to uh, uh, to bring about the policy making which is being directed by the government. They are also responsible for the collection of the land tax and for the property tax as well. They are uh, there to in, uh, to uh, uh, provide uh, to um, make sure that all the SAPs that are being laid by the government in the face of any situation uh, for that. And they are also there to uh, trickle down the policies from the to the grassroots as well. You have prompted me to another question. Does the assistant commissioner fall in at that level of policy making? Uh, sir, I believe it's more about policy implementation that is being uh, the, uh, based on the direction given by these stakeholders. Thank you, sir. Ji, sir, now the time has come for us to discuss the candidate. Sure. What are your views about her? Uh, she's properly dressed. She has a good verbal expression, almost appropriate uh, communication skills, good knowledge base. She has a good energy level as well. The only drawback that I found was her eye contact should have been better what she had. That's all. That's Thank all. you. That's all. Sir, I found uh, a Nurul Huda as a well-rounded well personality with fairly high level of confidence. Her conversational skills are also fine. She has good knowledge base both in optional and compulsory subjects. However, a little effort is needed in improving his um, general knowledge. One thing which is and again very noteworthy is that despite losing few questions, she maintained her composure. Uh, that speaks of her resilience and perseverance. And I find uh, ample potential uh, in her ample potential to perform well in interview. Thank you. Anwar Rashid, sir. Well, sir, <coughs> as discussed earlier, Nurul Huda is a good candidate and uh, I'm sure she'll make it. Uh, she has good analytical skills. She responded well with confidence, of course. And being from uh, mass communication as her major, she has good grasp of knowledge on international law. However, she needs to be improve her hand gestures and eye contact as pointed out by Mr. Rizwan Malik. Uh, I'm sure that she'll get through. Good. Thank you. I think I can't agree more with you. I found that the first thing that impressed me was she was very confident and very well composed and stayed that way throughout the interview. She spoke well, her delivery style was very impressive. Although the sometimes it 
I felt that the manner in which he was tackling the question, the sequence was not correct. Other than that, okay, body language, hand gestures, especially, and eye contact needed a little improvement. But knowledge base, solid. Yes. Energy level, very high. And I will rate her very good marks in this. And I hope she gets the service group of her choice. Thank you. Thank you.